myself referred in 2015 to the gambling clinic, although there was people there who would then support me as a group and that, I didn't really go. I didn't go. You know, my family right. didn't really know what was happening. So even though I'd said I wanted to go, I didn't really go there to be part of a group. Mm. And I went through those 12 weeks, maybe I went to eight of them, let's say, and I didn't take part up properly. And then there were support groups after that were run once a month. Now, I never went to one. I never, ever got involved again. And I just thought, this is all right. As I say, it's a habit. I can deal with this myself. I, I'm all right. You know, I, I'm a grown up. Of course I can stop doing this. You know, I'm not that weak, surely. Um, except it isn't about just being weak, you know. It's about actually when you're with other people, they understand you and that kind of thing. So the thing that didn't work was trying to do it on my own. The mm. thing that did work was getting in with a community of people who understood what I was going through. Welcome to the 1000 Day Sword Podcast. My name is Lee Davy. I'm not an alcohol. <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic. Boom. I refuse to be anonymous. Kapow. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol. Bosh. And I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. <laughs> Did you know that I used to be a gambling addict? I used to be a gambling addict. I wonder if I'm a gambling addict today. Huh? Right? Interesting, right? You know, so I had my first bet. When I had my first bet, I tell you my first memory, my earliest memory of a bet was my was the Grand National. So the Grand National is this um, huge horse race. Well, well, actually, the most famous horse race in the world, right? Um, and every time the Grand National would happen, my dad, who, you know, rarely showed any kind of interest in the family whatsoever, he would come home with the newspaper from the bookies with all these horses in the middle of the newspaper. All our hands would get dirty and black because of the newspaper. And he would allow us to choose a horse. And then he would go and put a bet on, maybe 10p each way or something. And then we'd all sit in front of the, uh, the telly as a family. Uh, minus my father, obviously, because he wasn't. We was with his proper family in the pub, and we would watch the race. And then if our horse came in, we'd get all excited that we were going to win, right? Um, and I think that is like, you know, the beginning. Well, back in the day, anyway, that was the beginning of people's interest in gambling. Uh, the other thing was back in the day, the bookmakers, which were on the high street, the windows were blacked out. So your dad, you know, you would you'd see people going in there, but you never knew what was happening there. So it was this intrigue and excitement, and another one of those um, things that young lads want to do when they're older to be a man. You know, you look at it and subconsciously you're thinking, oh, to be a man, I need to be in that bookmakers, right? So, and then these days you have the lottery. So um, you know, everybody's uh, uh, attached to the the quick. The quick fix of winning the lottery to solve all of their problems, right? I mean, so gambling is all around us, but we don't really see it. And we don't, um, we kind of like separate again, a little bit like in alcohol, where we view the alcoholic as the, um, you know, the archetype of what is all, all that is wrong with drinking alcohol. And as long as you're not like an alcoholic, then you're okay. Uh, it's similar with gambling, you know. People can gamble until their heart's content, until you don't lose everything. Um, but it's all the same shit. If you put in uh, money on the roulette table or, you, or you're um, playing bingo down a town hall with all your ladies, it's gambling. That's what it is. Um, and a greater understand of it will, extending of it will certainly help. When I stopped drinking over 10 years ago now, I stopped gambling at the same time. And um, other than relapsing drinking three years after I stopped in Vegas, where I, that night, I had three and a half grand in my pocket to play poker, and I put it all on red or black, I can't remember which one, and I lost in roulette. Uh, that's that's the only time I've ever had a bet of any kind uh, since then. And, you know, if any of you know my background, I worked in the poker industry for 10 years, so I've I existed and lived in casinos um, all that time, never once been triggered to have a bet. Never once been triggered to have a bet, so um, I'm I'm done with it. And if, oh, you know, if I wanted to have a bet today, would I go back into fully uh, uh, fledged gambling addiction? Hmm. Do you know what? I I, I wouldn't want to try. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to try. Um, I look at gambling now for myself personally as being um, a below the line activity. It's a, an unconscious activity. I'd have to question why I was doing it. Um, and most of the motivations would come from below the line. So 
I wouldn't go there. And I'm quite happy not being a gambling addict. So um, there you go. All right. But I know that for a lot of people who drink and have alcohol problems, uh, gambling problems uh, are attached to that or come along after we've stopped drinking. Uh, so I thought I would reach out to Chris Gillum and get Chris Gillum on the show. Uh, Chris is a 38-year-old recovering, what he calls a recovering alcoholic and disordered gambler. Um, he's a co-founder and host of the All Bets Are Off Gambling Recovery podcast. So we got Chris on to talk about gambling. Here's a little intro. For people trying to quit their addiction, certain things work, other things don't. After all, each person's journey is different. No one understands that better than this week's guest, Chris Gilham. Chris used to be addicted to drinking and gambling, but he has been on a steady path to recovery since 2017. And in this episode, he talks about his journey and what you should and shouldn't do to achieve the same. He discusses the importance of having a community, shares some tips you've probably never heard of before. So have a listen and start your successful path to recovery if gambling is a problem for you. We're going to learn all about Chris's extraordinary story, find out what other people usually don't get when it comes to this form of addiction and discovers what works and what doesn't work when you're trying to recover. So without further ado, I'll shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of Chris Gillum. Chris, Chris, Chris. Looks like you're in the jungle. Oh yeah, yeah. It looks good, isn't it? That's a new mirror that the wife put up with these uh Indoor plants, it's great, isn't it? It's a good yeah, look. I like it. I like it. Yeah, it's uh, you know, like whenever I get my uh, new house, I'm going to surround the place with plants because I think it's I think it's really important. So uh, tell I've, I've done a little introduction before this, but um, you know, just expand and go a little bit deeper, really, Chris. Tell us a little bit about your life story and your your um, troubles with addiction. Life story, eh? Yeah, wow, wow. I feel like I'm living a different life now. That's 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 the main thing, you know. That's good. Three yeah. years ago, you know, three years ago, I took my last drink and mm. I took my last and my last place, my last bet as well. I say mm. three years ago, actually, it's probably three and a quarter years ago now, because you know, just time flies. We were we were supposed to do this uh, a few months ago, and we had to keep putting yeah. it back. So it would have been mm. it would have been three three years then. But but yeah, yeah, and um, you know, it's one of those things from a young age. You know, I felt. I felt like I was always going to let myself down. I was a little bit scared of, um, yeah, you know, letting others down as well. And I, I don't know where it came from. Didn't really mm. come from anywhere other than myself, you know. I've got the mm. most amazing family, wonderful parents, who, you know, totally proud of me, always happy. And, and especially now, having come through the addictions. And um, for me, those addictions were alcohol and then gambling. Um, and it's the alcohol that started early. It started early. It started in my teens. Um, and I guess, you know, when I took that first drink, it was all a bit of fun, as it is with other people at that age. But I did quite quickly realise that I could suddenly feel a lot more comfortable in situations that I hadn't felt comfortable in before. So mm. I was certainly somebody who, you know, didn't like being around girls or didn't like being around certain conversations that friends might be having might make me feel uncomfortable. And for no reason, because then, you know, they weren't awkward conversations. It's just, I didn't like to be myself. I needed to be somebody else to feel comfortable. Um, and nobody else really knew that's how I felt because I never told anybody about any of my emotions until I got to the age of 35, funny enough, which is when I started to find recovery. But that's why the addictions took me. A lot of it was because I couldn't share how I felt. So to escape from how I was feeling, I found alcohol. And I did that, you know, from 14. I remember being at a party when I was 14, um, drinking at that party, um, my, my wife was at that party because I knew her as a kid as well. And it was all kind of fun. It was a laugh. That, you know, I had three cans of beer. Um, mm. But very quickly, I realised that I liked to be at places where there's drinking. I remember when we used to drink in the park with my friends. I always wanted to go to the pub, you know. I know mm. we were in the park, but I looked old enough to get to the pub. And that's where I really wanted to be. Because for me back then, it was all around. The, it looked good. It was fun. It was social as well. And um for me, I guess it made me feel a bit more powerful and important. You know, if we're out there hanging out where the older kids hang out or, you know, the grown-ups and having beer and beer's bloody brilliant, isn't it? You know, that's how I kind of <laughs> felt. Um, and it was good, except obviously I was doing it to mask as well. You know, I was having fun and I was enjoying it, but I was also doing it to mask a lot of my difficult feelings. Um, I remember when I was a kid, you know, things like uh, – I remember being at school one day and I needed that evening. I was supposed to be playing a cricket match. I was the cricket captain in the team. 
Mm. The same night I was supposed to be playing my guitar in a guitar recital and both teachers wanted me to do it. So rather than being somebody who's able to say, hold on a minute, I want to do this one or what time are they both? Maybe I can do both. Total worry, absolute dread. Like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I can't let them down because then they won't like me anymore. Maybe this will ruin all my chances in the whole future of playing another game of cricket or yeah. absolutely ridiculous. But what happened was I was sick that day. Was I really sick? I felt sick, but it was all from anxiety and all that kind of stuff. But it was drinking that made me feel more comfortable in those situations. And that anxiety left me. It left me for many years until things got worse, you know, through my twenties as things went on. Yeah, I was drinking, I was having fun, but I noticed I was drinking more than others around me. I noticed that when others were going home, I was not going home or going home and drinking on my own. Or doing things like working out how I could get a meeting in the end of the day at work and and get straight out from that meeting rather than having to go back to my desk and have a few drinks on the way home. And then I wasn't allowed to drink on the train that I was on because I work for Transport for London, so I can't drink on that train line. So what I did instead was found a different train line to jump on and have beers. And then that was, you know, it was absolutely crazy. And all mm. I should have been doing was going home and seeing my beautiful family, uh, which is what I get to do now. Um but, you know, that, that went on, that went on, and I got to about the age of 30. And uh, when I was drinking and those feelings were, were going, you know, when I was feeling more comfortable for all those years with the drink, you know, I was suddenly drinking and I didn't feel better. I didn't feel like I was escaping these horrible feelings. And then I quite accidentally, really, fell into gambling. Um, and that was then my second vice for five years. At the same mm. time as drinking, the drinking never stopped. But the gambling came on top and it happened very like, um, like I say, it was just, it was accidental how it happened. I was at work and doing some sweepstakes with people and, you know, things like that. And then very quickly I thought, oh, I won. That felt all right. And then very quickly it went to downloading lots of apps on my phone and then, you know, sports betting, but not just betting on the outcome of games, which is what I was doing. I was then in play sports betting. And then that moved on to betting on dogs as well and betting on horses and then betting on virtual dogs and horses. So like cartoon dogs, cartoon horses that you can bet on all night long. Then that moved on to land-based casinos I was going to as well. And I remember one day sitting outside a casino in Stratford in London early in the morning on my phone playing on an online casino. Now that Stratford casino is a 24 hour day casino, but I didn't have any cash. So that's the one, Aspers, yeah. And I didn't have the money on me to go in there. So I needed to get to my bank. I didn't have a bank card either at this time. Mm. Well, it it was looked after by others because I couldn't have it because I was a gambler, but I I was going to devise a way of getting money. And I did, I went into the bank and, they accepted it was me through some other ID that I had. I got my money, went into the casino. But for an hour, I'd sat outside that casino hmm. spinning slot machines on my phone. And it's absolutely insane. And that's where it took me, you know. It was that kind of stuff. And as well as that, it's, yeah, say online casinos, land-based casinos, bookies, dog tracks. It was consuming me 24 hours a day. And the thing that um, I sometimes think about, it was it was quite an incredible day in my life. I uh, took the afternoon off of work to go to the pub. So I hadn't told anybody I'd taken it off. I was going to go have loads of beers in the afternoon, go home, do the standard. Oh, I've just had a couple of beers on the way home. Hmm. Absolute lie. But I went into the bookmakers near the station there in Farringdon in London just to bet on a couple of horse races. I found myself there for hours and didn't make it to the pub. And I had like this, um, it was the first time that little voice in my head, the gambling voice got louder than the drinking voice. The drinking voice was saying, come on, Chris, come on, we've got to get to the pub. That's what, we can't, that's what we're off for. The gambling mm. one saying, no, 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 you've got to say it. There's another race in a minute. This could be the winner. Um, and if it did win, it made no difference because then I was going to just put all that onto the next one until I finally lost. Mm. But there was a third me in that situation. And that third me just wanted to go home and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. Um, and yeah, you know, it, it carried on like that. From that day, it got progressively worse. In in 2015, I decided I wanted to stop gambling, um, but I didn't want to stop drinking. So I self-referred myself to a gambling clinic in London. And as although I, I, you know, I went there with the, you know, I really didn't want to gamble again. 
Hmm. There was something in me that said, if you, if you can't give up drinking, Chris, and you really, really need to, drinking had been the long vice, the long thing that had helped me out through my life, you know, my best friend, which was actually my worst enemy. Yeah. And I was so scared to stop that. I would, I'd, go to, um, I'd go to the gambling clinic. I had 12 CBT sessions there. And I didn't make all of them because some of them I just stayed in the pub. <laughs> and some of them I didn't do the homework. And it was like, do you know what? I think I've just got a bit of a habit here. I can stop. Mm. And mm. I did stop for, I don't know, uh, nearly a year probably. But um, I did a raffle then at my kid's school. And one thing a gambler shouldn't do, in my opinion, and, you know, this is what we would say at Gamblers Anonymous, certainly, and, and, and other, other ways of, you know, there are lots of different peer support groups out there now for gambling support and um, gambling harm. And I would always say, you know, a raffle is gambling. And I say that because I won a raffle a year after going to that clinic and the feelings were exactly the same. And I explain it like, um, my, so my son suffered from Tourette's in his life. So you sometimes he'll tick. That's what I did when I was gambling. I looked like I had Tourette's because, you know, the, the movements in my body were, and I couldn't, I couldn't control them. I was so excited. I was so nervous at the same time. Um, and I won this raffle and I left my little daughter in a field while I ran to a stage. All these parents were applauding. Yeah, he's won the first prize. And then I got back to the field and my daughter had gone. And I was like, crikey. What happened there? You know, I should never have done that raffle, but I'd done it. And I got back and I was like, where is she? I did manage to find her um, a few minutes later, but very quickly I turned back in to dad, not the addict. Mm. Um, and that was a very scary moment. And, and then, I, you know, I didn't gamble again for a number of months, but when things got stressful um, in 2017, so I didn't finish gambling until the end of 2017, then October 2017, the 29th of October 2017, in fact, and the last drink was on the 1st of October. 2017 but there was a lot going on in that year i had um depression very bad i was off work um we had building works being done in the house um and a lot was getting to me a lot was getting to me but interestingly i was in a very very good place as well because gambling debts from the past and that had all been paid off so on paper you know i looked good you know what everything was really mm. good but there was something within me that i couldn't control and the drinking and the gambling that year was horrendous. And I say the gambling, it was, the gambling was done in a couple of binges, whereas mm. the drinking was continuous all the way throughout. And I just remember when I was at work during that year, and some of the year before as well, in the morning going to work on the train, scared to close my eyes because every time I closed my eyes, I felt like, felt like I was going to die. I just mm. felt like my body was going to give way. But as that year went on, it was more like not being scared. It was more like hopeful. When I close those eyes, maybe this will be it. Maybe I really won't wake up and then, then it's all right. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, on that final day when I was gambling, um, I lost all my money, which was financed by the, well, we have this building work done. And basically I spent the money, which was for the building work. Um, so I then took a loan out that night as well. The biggest loan a bank would give me, which was £25,000 on that night, and put it straight into an online casino and lost that within two and a half hours, which is crazy that they can allow that to happen. It um, is, isn't it? Just, you know, just, say that, just say that again for people listening. You, you, were, you got a loan of £25,000. The casino allowed you to put it on. You blew it in two hours. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I mean, how it actually worked was, so the story really is over eight days. I had this account open just for eight days. Uh. And of that eight days, I gambled on four of them. Now, one of those days, I gambled £500. So, really, I don't count it as such. <laughs> Typical gambler. <laughs> yeah, it's £500. <laughs> yeah, think about that. So, like, I, I just got to stop you. That's great. It's like the ra a raffle is like a nuclear warhead. And then in the next sentence, like £500, nothing. It's so, <laughs> no, so it's, it's you're right. It's, it's the mind of the gambler, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah. the reason I say it in this instance is because the first day I gambled 11,400 and, you know, they didn't stop. They just took my money. Then mm. there was this 500 pound day. And actually the reason it was 500 pounds was probably because I couldn't get hold of any more money. That's what yeah. I think happened yeah. on that day. Yeah. Um, but then the final two, I called it, it was the final two days. But really it was late one night into early next morning. Um, and the amount, I mean, basically I, I did over those four days, a year's salary, a year's salary, mm. you know, and yeah. it's absolutely mad. And they could allow that to happen. And that's why I'm quite active now in trying to get some change in, in the UK, mm. actually, around, you know, gambling and stuff. But the best thing happened was losing that night. Mm. The best thing that happened was then getting found out a few days later, because what I was going to do, in fact, in fact, the next day was when I got found out. Because on the 30th of, Jan sorry, not January, the 30th of October, I was planning to go to the pub with my friend 
for one final booze up. And then I was mm. going to tell my wife and mum and dad the next day about the gambling. And also that I'd come to a place where I'm going to stop drinking as well. So I know I can't do one without the other. As I was leaving on that night to go to the pub, my wife looked at me and she just said, have you done it again? She Best knew. thing as well. She knew, and I couldn't lie. Thank God, I didn't want to lie. Because I planned to go out that night, but would I really have said anything the next day? Would I have returned home that night? I can't answer those questions. I don't know. But I'm mm. so thankful that she asked me. We went straight to my parents, kind of everybody crying, kind of horrendous time, really. But what was really good, because we'd been in this situation before, what was really good this time, my mum sat there and said, he's going to change. He's got, you know, he realises this is different. And she has been proved right so far, which is amazing. And, you know, that was on a, that was on a Sunday night. And then that Thursday night that week, I went to my first Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And then the Friday night, I went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And it just gave me the opportunity to change my life. You know, I went there and I thought I was going to see some old guys in coats drinking from bottles or a little dog in the corner with them. And it wasn't that at all. It was mm. men, it was women of different ages, all different careers, all just people like me who had got dragged in, dragged into these addictions because we've got, we've got our own reasons, haven't we? But, you know, we felt uncomfortable in certain situations and this was essentially our medication. Whereas now, Gamblers Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, me talking to people, that's my medication. Me talking mm. to people is so important. It's the one thing I couldn't do for 35 years. It's the thing that got me into the situation where I was. I couldn't say to somebody, today's a bad day, or I've been feeling really rough the last few days, or this kind of thing really embarrasses me. Like when I was getting married, I couldn't bear the thought of holding my wife's hand in front of people and that kind of stuff. Mm. Everybody there knew we were getting married. Like, why would I feel like that? But I did. Whereas now I can tell people, you know, I love you because you've done these things for me or I love you just because I do. I would never have been able to tell anybody I loved them back in the day because it just sent this horrible feeling through me, this absolute shudder. And it, I guess it was felt like I was a bit weak. I was a bit pathetic. I don't know. But it's absolute opposite when you say that, isn't it? You tell somebody you love them, that's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Chris. Know a hell of a lot more about you now than I did before we started out. Um, Going to talk about focus on the gambling a little bit because that's one of the primary reasons that I got you on here. I don't want to um, um, dismiss the alcohol because I know that is a major part of it, but uh, I would like to focus on the gambling. I don't think I've ever had a guest on here actually where we talked about gambling addiction before, so that'd be interesting. Um, what? didn't work for you so when you were when you were trying to quit gambling what didn't work for you what didn't work for me was trying to do it on my own that is that is that's the first thing I think so when I self-referred in 2015 to the gambling clinic although there was people there who would then support me as a group and that I didn't really go and <laughs> I didn't go you know my family right. didn't really know what was happening so even though I'd said I wanted to go I didn't really go there to be part of a group. Mm. And I went through those 12 weeks. Maybe I went to eight of them, let's say. And I didn't take part properly. And then there were support groups after that were run once a month. Now, I never went to one. I never, mm. ever got involved again. And I just thought, it's just all right. As I say, it's a habit. I can deal with this myself. I, I'm all right. You know, I, I'm a grown-up. Of course I can stop doing this. You know, I'm not that weak, surely. Um Except it isn't about just being weak, you know. It's about actually when you're with other people, they understand you and that kind of thing. So the thing that didn't work was trying to do it on my own. The mm. thing that did work was getting in with a community of people who understood what I was going through and talking to them about how I felt because they would say to me, whoa, I felt that as well. Or do you know that thing you just said? I tried this and it really helped me. And that's what I needed. And that's what I would have got if I'd gone to that monthly uh, peer group as well that peer network but i didn't do it but in 2017 right. when i went to gamblers anonymous and i did it that's when it started working because i surrounded myself with all these people a lot of the advice i got in 2015 and 2017 was the same things like yeah. you need to give over your finances to somebody else and i did that in both instances you know i did that in both instances you need to make sure you've got um, self-excluded from online casinos or land-based casinos and all that kind of stuff and i did that 
Mm. Although I found more online casinos to get back onto further down the line. Um, but at the time I did, I did it self-exclude. And I self-excluded from land-based casinos in 2015. So I was never able to go back into them. So I took on these pieces of advice. But then I tried to do everything myself. And I pretended I was all right. And I never spoke about anything. And if you don't surround yourself with people, you can't talk. So what really happened was all the reasons I'd got into that place and that, that situation in the first place of being a gambler, who was suffering gambling harm was because I wasn't talking. So I was trying to find an escape. As mm. soon as I found the support groups in 2017, well, then I had people to talk to every week. And I had people to talk to in between meetings every week who understood me. And then also that then helped me to talk to my family about stuff as well. And my family go to gammon as well. So they kind of get to understand the gambler side of things with me but they also get to talk to people who like them have been harmed by gambling by a member of their family so that's all kind of brought us closer together so that helps me to talk to them about stuff but it also means that I find it easier to talk to my friends mm. now I've got five well I've got lots of friends but I've got like a whatsapp group with five friends who I've been friends with since the age of 11 and they've you know they've never gone they've never gone away but I don't think I ever really told them that much about me until I was in recovery yeah. And now I talk to them all the time. And, you know, okay. and I can tell them if I'm having a bad day or a good day. And, uh, and that's wonderful. So that is, that is the big difference for me. It's about trying to do something on your own or trying to do something with people who genuinely understand it can help you. And okay. that GA has then progressed. So it's not just going to GA every week. It's now, you know, I'm part of a Twitter community as well who, you know, mm. we'll help each other on Twitter. And that was something I couldn't believe. I was like, oh, surely people just go on Twitter and, saying the mickey out of each other, you know, and that kind of stuff. But no, actually, there's people there who genuinely care about each other. Mm. Um, and I've done that with the alcohol and, and the gambling, you know. Um, that's absolutely amazing. And then I started a podcast during uh, lockdown, uh, so April 2020, with a guy called Ryan, somebody called Kish, someone called Kelly. And now uh, Kelly's moved on and we've got somebody called Tracy there. Now, we hadn't met each other, but we started this gambling recovery podcast called the all bets are off podcast and we did mm. that because we came together on twitter and then mm. we used that to help each other as well so we were starting to talk to each other weekly and it's an even bigger network an even bigger community and then through that podcast we've met others outside of our podcast and it's like you're doing now again it, absolutely and now we're talking mm. so our networks are getting bigger and it's somebody else you can talk to just when you need a you need an ear to listen okay. and i'm really comfortable talking now so there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of things in there then for people listening. Uh, one was the, let me just turn that off. Somebody just beeped in my ear. Um, there's the talking. So having people um, around you who you feel like, I'm not going to say judgment-free because I think we all judge. It's just kind of an automatic thing. But we're around people who the judgments of us aren't really piercing or anything like that. And we feel like they understand us. So that's important. Um, the other thing you said that I think is really important that might have got lost in there if people weren't paying attention, if they were running around the block or something, is um, Chris said the information and the support system was available to him um, earlier, but he didn't take advantage of that. So I want to draw attention to people is in, you know, the buck stops with you. Like within podcasts like this, um, coaching by people like Chris, uh, things like Gamblers Anonymous, 12 Steps, uh, workshops like the Strive Method for Addictions, they're only there to get you on the path, you know? And then once they get you on the path, you've got to do the work, you've got to show up, you've got to feel uncomfortable, you've got to feel vulnerable, you've got to talk about your shame. You don't do that. It doesn't matter how good the system is. So we have to take 100% responsibility for us, for our state and, and how we get in and out of that. Um, what were some of the things that you could talk to with a gambling addict that they would get that normal people wouldn't get that weren't, uh, didn't have a gambling problem? I guess the first one is where people just don't understand it. They just say, well, just stop. Just mm. stop. Well, no, I can't stop. And one of the things I don't think some people understand is, so it's with the alcohol, people understood that I was putting something into my body, okay? So if somebody puts something into your body, you think, oh, yeah, there's some kind of reaction going on there. But you're not putting something in, you're not putting a substance into your body when it's gambling. Mm. But, you know, the, you're still getting those feelings. You're still getting like that dopamine hit in the head. You know, it's, it's a very similar feeling. But I think people just think, oh, this person maybe can't control themselves if they're doing that. Well, no, it, it's the same. You know, for me, it was the same experience as with as with drinking and as it would be with drug use or whatever the case may be. 
And that's where people can get addicted to anything. Shopping, you know, shopping's a massive one, isn't it, as well? And, you know, you're not mm. putting anything into your body there. I think it's becoming more understood now, but certainly that is one of the things to talk to people who had that kind of feeling that others thought they should just stop. Because um, you're not I mean, ingesting you're taught- a substance. Because you're not ingesting the substance exactly. Mm. But you know, you're still performing an act repetitively over and over again, and you're getting feedback from that. And you know, the gambling industry, by their very nature, what they do is they design addictive products because they want people to continue to play on those products because that's how they make their money. That's kind of how the model works. And um, which mm. is why people who are problem gamblers, as, as as I as I fell into that category, give them a lot of their money. As we kind of went through the kind of sums I went through very quickly earlier, you know, that's a lot of money for a casino. People mm. who gamble um, within their means, which is what people should do, because gambling should just be a leisure kind of leisure activity. But they might spend £100 in a month, £60, £50. I was doing that in seconds. So there's something that was making me do that. And it wasn't because I couldn't control myself. It wasn't because, you know, I hold down a full-time job. I've had the same job for 13 years and I've done very well in that job. I'm a father of two and I love my kids dearly and actually I was a good dad for all this Mm. stuff as well. You know, they were never in any kind of danger or anything like that. But put a roulette wheel in front of me and all I could do was sit there and watch a ball go round and round and round until it landed in number two. And then once it landed in number two, I had to do it again until it landed in number two again and then again and then again. And I could not stop it. I couldn't stop it. I mean, you need to go to the toilet. You're standing in a casino at a table and you know, because this is how my head would work, I know the next role is going to be the number two. So I can't go to the yeah, toilet. Yeah, you can't, you can't go to the toilet because, you know, when you come back, you're, you're, you would have missed your bet. So it's happening. Yeah, and it's, you know I, was reading, I was reading the other day how in American casinos, the slot machine um, grinders, they wear nappies, they wear adult nappies. And, uh, and the, the casinos know it because they find them in the toilets and they see them mm. hanging out of the back because they just piss themselves because they think that the machine is going gonna, is gonna to hit. So what, what separates, you know, my, my mum who does the lottery from you who sits there staring at the roulette wheel hoping two is going to come in? What, what, do you think, what do you think in your self-reflection and your journey is different from you and uh, other people? I mean, I put myself in that bracket, actually, because obviously I had my own uh, gambling addiction as well. But um, what do you think it is with you? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I first started gambling, I could put money on the lottery or I could put money on a football bet and that would come in and I could walk away. But at mm. some point, I got a feeling. I got um, past like an invisible line, which just meant that couldn't happen because my body wouldn't allow it to happen. Once, as soon as I started it, it's like we say now, quite anonymous, you take the first drink, that's the one that does the damage. For me, that's the same in gambling. As soon as I put that first bet on now, that does the damage for me. But there was a time when it wasn't like that. Something happened with me that made that change. And partly it might have been the change in products I was using. So at first it was that I was just doing it at work. So handing over, say, £10 cash to somebody who then went and kind of put everybody's money onto a horse or onto a football match. And that was different to then me actually performing the task over or the activity over and over again. And then when I started getting that feedback regularly, that feedback's like, oh, I've won or I've lost. It changed when it went for, actually, this is a point, it changed for me when it was... It isn't, oh, I've won. It was, it became anticipation as opposed to winning or losing. Winning or losing didn't matter anymore. At the mm. start, I placed a bet because I thought, well, this is fun, but wouldn't it be nice if it comes off? So really, I was trying to win. After a little while, it wasn't about that. It was about moving myself into a place where I could change how I felt. And in that environment, the real world wasn't there anymore. It didn't matter. I had my glass of wine and my can of beer downstairs and I had my laptop on my on my lap and it was like I was in a different world and all the worries I had around me, they didn't exist anymore. Not for that time when I was there. And that was the difference for me. Before that, I was just gambling. I was just having a drink when I was much younger. And then suddenly I crossed the line and I crossed that line because I can't even explain why it happened. I just know how the feeling changed. There was a feeling, you know, like mm. suddenly it's like I couldn't come away. It was like I was magnetised, you know, and I can feel it now. It kind of felt like in the middle of my stomach, 
I got this feeling where I was just attached. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but like a magnetic field to me and what was in front of me, like I couldn't move. I couldn't move. It felt heavy. I needed to be there. And there was blinkers on. It was like, it was like I was in this bubble. I was in this bubble and nothing else mattered. So once I was in that bubble, I couldn't leave. It was like when I first started gambling, that bubble didn't exist that bubble appeared at some point. So every time I put myself into that situation, I put myself into a bubble and it was about escape. And it all was about escape. I think I am addicted to escape. So now I have to find good ways of using my time. And, you know, if there's something a bit difficult, I need to do something productive to help me mm. move my feelings so I can escape what I'm feeling. Well, Having said that, I still need to face up to stuff. I was going to say, what was you, what was you escaping from? I was escaping from my own feelings and thoughts, I think, you know, so I was always scared that I was letting people down. I was always scared that I wasn't good enough. Well, actually, while I was drinking or gambling, I could say I'm, I'm good at performing this activity. I might not be good at winning, for example, but I'm good at performing what I'm doing. You know, I feel safe. I feel comfortable in this environment. When I was outside of that, I didn't feel comfortable in my environment wherever I was because I said you know for many years I drank and the reason I drank was to feel it comfortable in a situation where with my friends or feel comfortable in a situation where I don't know people well that stopped working and I was drinking and in those situations it still felt uncomfortable so when I then gambled and suddenly after a little while it gave me that comfort as well I could start to feel comfortable in a situation again whereas honestly like I never felt comfortable it wasn't like I was ever feeling comfortable outside of that bubble for the last few years. I was never comfortable. Um, so it was a lovely place to be, a lovely mm. place to be that was causing me incredible harm. And so the way I look at it now is there were two things that I was so scared to stop because I was so comfortable in like the bubble, which was gambling and drinking. Now I've managed to come out of that and I've gone on this exciting journey because that's what I think of it now as an exciting journey. It was difficult at the start and it can be difficult some days now, but generally it's just really good. Um, now there's just two things I can't do, but I can do everything else. I feel like I've released myself now and now I feel comfortable in all situations. And mm -hmm. if, it, if I don't feel comfortable in that situation, I just think, I wonder why I don't feel comfortable in this situation. And I'll do something to make myself feel comfortable. So, for example, if I'm in a place where I don't know people, whereas I would have hid in the past and I would have started drinking and get out of the way, stand at the end of the bar, I'll probably just go and talk to somebody. Because once I've made that step, then I've done something. And it makes it a bit easier. What's the worst that can happen? That person tells me to go away. And actually, I don't mind that now. But back then, that would have... Oh, that would have been like a dagger in the heart, you know? It's mm. quite amazing that once I managed to get out of this bubble that I felt comfortable in, well, now I feel safe. Well, is, I it, better than... is it safe, is it safe to say that um that gambling gave you purpose? So yes. you know, I I remember for me, for example, you know, back then I wasn't I wasn't woke enough to even be considering purpose. I was just a, I just worked on the railway. My plan was to work there until I was 55 and retire. So like I had, I had no purpose. I had no greater meaning and I never liked going into work. Like there was never a day I wanted to go into work. Right. So, so there's nothing there. And then all of a sudden you can gamble so you can escape from work. You can escape from life. You get into the zone, you know, talking a little bit about like me high, Chick sink me high. So we get into flow um, and you forget about the world. And now you've got purpose because like, oh, I'm a gambler. My purpose today um, is to is to do this act of gambling. It's not even about the money, right? It's like, I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. But yeah, is it, it was purpose coming to it for you? Yeah, the way you put that is, is absolutely brilliant, actually. I'm not sure I'd thought about it like that before, but yeah, I can see that because it did give me a purpose. It gave me a reason to go and do something. Hmm. Whereas that you were good at and you could I identify with. Yeah, exactly. And, and the funny thing is though, cause I remember the first time I went into a land based casino through for the first three times I didn't gamble cause I didn't know what to do. And that was going to make me uncomfortable. But once I did gamble when I was in there, suddenly I realized, Oh, this isn't that hard. I mean, how is it hard? You know, putting some, <laughs> putting some chips on a table, but in my head, it was like a new thing and I couldn't cope with it. So, but when I did do it, I suddenly thought, this is all right. And I got into that 
habit of doing the same thing over and over again. And when you do the same thing over and over again, you can start to feel, I'm quite good at this. I'm good mm-hmm. at the at the act. I'm good at the, the behavior. Like I say, not good at the winning or losing because that's a matter of chance. Yeah, it doesn't. When I say, you know, when I say, when I say you're good at so for people listening, when I say you're good at it, like so in gambling circles, you know, like I have a friend like Neil Channing, like he's made he's made a lot of money gambling. Like, you know, um Harala but Harala boss Fulgaris, right? Like he 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 won millions from NBA, right? There are people out there that turn this into a vocation, but then there are punters like me and Chris who just go and spunk our money up a wall, right? So I'm not saying we're good at like gambling, but we, we're good at being a gambler. And what I mean by, let me tell you a little bit of a story, Chris, and see if this resonates. So um, in the book, The the King, the Warrior, and the Magician, the Lover, which talks about immature masculine energy and mature masculine energy, um, the final kind of like a pinnacle of boy immature masculine energy is the hero. So the hero is like Tom Cruise in Maverick, in Top Gun. And he's all about himself. He's all about consumption. He's all about outside in validation. Like he cannot love himself. He needs to get his love and his status from outside of himself. He needs to take risks um, that put himself and other people at danger. Um, And he just wants to fight the fucking world, Um, not to protect people, but just because he wants to show people that he can do this shit. Right. And that's like, for me, when I was gambling, I realized now looking back, holy shit, that was like my hero energy. That was like my boy. I just, when I was in there, like losing 25 grand in a couple of minutes, where is this shame attached to that? There's also pride attached to it. It's like, look at me. I just fucking, I just gamble. I'm the guy who spends 25 grand in four hours gambling, right? And there was a status element to that. There was like, I want you to recognize that I am someone and I am, and I am, I am capable of doing shit that you can't do, right? And that is like the whole kind of like the status thing for me. Did any of that resonate at all? I think from listening to what you said there, there's some there's something that came to mind. It's like sitting at the blackjack table, right? You're sitting there and you win a good hand, or you're the, you're at the end of the table and you make the right call, and people are like betting behind you on the yeah, yeah, yeah. They bet they bet and, your money because you're on a streak and yeah. you figure the kingpin all of a sudden. Absolutely, yeah. and it's absolutely crazy because I remember the first thing that happened. I was like, "What are these people doing?" And it was like, "Oh my god, what's going you think on?" It's but then, cheeky, when, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But then when you're doing it, you're like, whoa, these people want to bet on what I'm doing. This is amazing. And you mm. feel so good. And and I wasn't even just bet playing, you know, when I was playing blackjack, what I was really on the blackjack table for most of the time was to play like the games on the side. Mm. So like, you know, if like, oh, if you pull out four aces here, you, you know, it's like ridiculous odds and you can win loads of money. I was like, that's what I'm here for. So every time I put the same amount on that as I was on the actual cards on the hand itself. So even if I won the hand, I'd probably still down. Mm. But I still felt good for winning that hand. And yeah, it's amazing when people are just next to you kind of high fiving you and stuff. And mm. yeah, madness. So there's, so so there's, I totally so there's definitely that. there's definitely like for people listening, for me anyway, and, and you know, like and Chris is 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 feeling it as well. There's definitely a status element of it, which 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 is similar to alcohol, right? Like, you know, if we suddenly say we don't want to drink anymore, um, and we've got we've been drinking with our friends for 30, 40 years, there's a status element. We don't want to be seen as going down in status and if our mask and our armor came on because we had low self-esteem and we really didn't want to be seen why the heck would we want our status to drop so we want to drink more even though we know it's bad for us and we want to gamble more even though it's bad for us because there's a status issue at play it's an identity thing okay so i want to ask you um where does money come into this so um let me just share a little bit of my story and then and then uh, to give some context. So for me, it was all about the money and it wasn't about the money. What do I mean by that? Um, I hated going to work on the railway. I was a manager, so I can't couldn't earn any more money. And I realized that, oh, I could earn money quicker gambling. And if I could be a success, I wouldn't have to go to the railway. So that was when money meant something to me. It also meant something to me when I got myself in a hole, because the only way of getting out of that hole was money. And, and to the degree that if I lost like 
10 grand on Man United losing to Liverpool at uh, four o'clock on a Sunday, then I would have to find an even money bet for 10 grand on, on Tiddlywinks that night online because I couldn't go to bed unless I was unless I was straight, right? So and then there was a side of it where the money didn't matter, where I would be going to work. I had this, I had this artificial intelligence bot that someone designed for me, and I would set it up to put my horse racing lays on and i would come on and look at it to see if i'd won or lost thousands of pounds I'm like you know there's nothing but i was thinking about it all day um but it but it wasn't it wasn't it that part wasn't about the money like it, it was it was gone something deeper than that so for you where where does the money thing kind of show up yeah it's a really interesting one so for me i mean there, yeah, there were times in it where I thought, oh, wow, I could win big now. And there must have been an element in there where there was like that big win stuff that I wanted. But it really didn't come down to that much at all for me. Mm. It really was about a way to change how I felt. That's really what it was at first. And was you aware, was you aware to... of that, though, at the time? Like, was you, is this a hindsight thing or an awareness at the time? So was you saying to yourself, oh, I'm really low right now. I need to go and spend 25 grand in Aspers. Or are you looking back in hindsight going, what the fuck went on there? And then you are oh, right. I needed to yeah. change my state. It's a, hind- it's a hindsight thing. Mm, yeah. But I didn't have to wait till I got to recovery to realize it, if that makes right. sense. So I think yeah, I re- yeah. cause, because I was going through that thing in 2015, which was two years before recovery, I started to question stuff then and I started yeah. to realize it then. And, and it kind of went from um, this kind of escape you know the money didn't matter and in fact i think i've always had a really weird relationship with money where i don't like it i'd rather get rid of it and gambling really helps with that (laughs) wow (laughs) that is massive chris chris that is massive what you just said then because you know if you get into the realms of manifestation for example you know and um and you know you start saying hey universe give me all the money i need and all that kind of thing which is something i've gone into lately and really really works for me my peer group said to me, Lee, you need to be better at holding on to your money. You're, you're inviting it in and you're good and you're manifesting and you're gathering it, but you're letting it go. You've got to stop that shit. Now, if you don't want to hold on to it, gambling is the fucking best way to get rid of it, right? Well, absolutely. I found it very, very stressful to have money. If you mm. don't have any money, I found like I couldn't stress about it. Um, now, that's a bit different now, further down the line. But, you know, I yeah. still have to manage it very carefully because I know that money is something you have to have in life. You know, I don't want millions or anything like that, but I need enough to to live my life and, you know, feed my kids and have my house and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's a really interesting one. So I really wasn't doing it to win it's so odd because I did want to get rid of the money, but at the same time, in the moment, sometimes sitting there, like I said, I was playing those extra hands on the side of the table. Well, I wanted to win big money then. So it kind of Mm. doesn't make sense. It kind of contradicts itself. But, but for me, I wasn't ever sitting there thinking I was going to win loads of life changing money. That wasn't really the plan. And as it went further on, it very much became a self harm thing as well. So Mm. really it got to a place where like, Oh, and the, la- the last year, once we were doing the house up, you know, I thought I've had all these problems before. We're doing the house up now. We've got the money to do that. Not sure I deserve this. And that's where I started with the kind of harm, even okay. more drinking, even more gambling. And it was about hurting myself. So I got to the place one night where I was, you know, about to take my life. Mm. And thank God I didn't. But, but it was harm. It was self-harm. Absolutely mad. Mm. We, actually, we actually, in the Stripe Method for Addictions, in this stuck phase, our first month, we talk about upper limit problems from Gay Hendricks, the big leap. And, and you just described one then is, you know, it sounds like you get to a place where your life is really good. Like the house is being renovated. I'm making this up, right? But your house is getting renovated. You're in love with your your wife. You're, you're feeling great as a father. You're, you're doing really well, like, um, you know, in, in work and stuff. And then you start to freak out and you're like, okay, um, this is getting too good. And you don't know because you're not used to experiencing that joy and celebration. So what you subconsciously do is you sabotage. And we all sabotage in different ways. I sabotage by fighting with people. It sounds like you, in those, back in those days, you would sabotage by blowing the money. And then you've got to face up and break those relationships, right? Because, you know, you can't just go like to your wife and be really 
Hey, um, just got to tell you something. I blew 25 grand yesterday and I know you're going to be pissed with me, but can we just get past this? Like this lot of shame and you know she's going to fall out with you and she's going to be very angry with you and your trust is going to erode. So that sabotages your relationship. You've sabotaged your house and now you're ashamed to be there with your children, right? It's like it's a perfect antidote, right? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And now further down the line and looking back in hindsight, you just think, how could I ever feel like that? But that is exactly how I felt. That is exactly how I felt. Because if you lose it all and then you have to go and say it's all gone, there's a huge relief. It's mm. a huge relief. But it's a huge relief that I never want to have again because I don't mm. want anybody else to be put in that situation. And I know how terrible I felt. But that relief was such a big feeling that it kind of overcame all the badness, you know, all that bad stuff. But, you know, now I know that I talk to somebody in that situation. Do you know what I mean? So if I'm starting to feel like things are too good, it's okay to say to somebody things feel too good. Whereas I used to think you can't say things feel too good. I'm already too scared to say things feel too bad, which is what I should have been saying. But actually, you can say anything to people to make yourself feel better. Do you know what happened to me as well, which I I think was, um, you know, led to my downfall was I'm I, it's the opposite of actually what you're describing. It's, it's weird. I've learned in hindsight that low self-esteem has followed me through my entire life, right? I've learned that it went through a lot of introspection, but at the same time, the mask and the art, uh, the, the mask that I wore was a very confident mask. So, and I wore it so well that I actually went through life thinking that I was like, a really confident guy. Now today I can say from a place of consciousness and presence that I'm a confident guy, right? Um, but that that mask at the time, so this confidence was masking low self-esteem, it didn't help because my problems were never big enough for me to stop. So I would, I would, I was, I was like, it took me to get to like I got to thirty thousand pounds in credit card debt, right? Sounds like you was way leagues ahead of me in that respect, right? And and I and I struggle. I started to struggle to hide it. Um. So so it, it for me like I wasn't worried about blowing the money because I just said to myself in my head, ah, oh, money will come. Like I'll get money from somewhere. But I didn't. My problem was that that I didn't know where to hide it anymore because I still hadn't told my wife. Right. So this confidence of, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter if I keep betting and betting and betting because I'm just going to keep getting money. It's just going to come to me really didn't help me. I think if I if I would have been more like, oh, fuck, where am I going to get the money from? What am I going to do? Like, you know, then things would have been different for me, because, of course, when it comes to gambling addiction, money's fuel. Like if I don't have any money, I don't have no fuel. It's like you said, you sat outside Aspen's Casino on your phone. You can't get in because you've got no money. Like it's like the car won't start because I've got no gas. Like. Mm. It's a crazy thing. It's like, you know, like the amount of people I talk to who just say, I could not wait to just lose my wages. As soon as I got paid, I lost them all. And the reason I lost them all was because then all that pain went away, all that worry, all that worry about the next bet because I haven't got the money, haven't got the fuel, can't do mm. it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I've never thought of it from a point of self-harm before. Um, something else I wanted to talk to you about, we might have um, different opinion, differing opinions on this one, actually, so it'd be good for people to, to listen to. And um, when I left the railway after 20 years, I, 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 it's bizarre, I paid my gambling debt off playing poker. Okay, so, like, I haven't, I haven't had a bet in over 10 years. No, no, no. I've had one bet in 10 years. I relapsed drinking in Vegas three years after I stopped. I had three and a half grand in my pocket to play poker. I got drunk. I put it all on red and it came in black. That is like the only bet I've had in like 10 years. But I played a lot of poker and people always say to me, yeah, but that's fucking betting. That's gambling. And then I get in the whole, yeah, but poker's a game of skill. La, 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 la. Right. Okay. I get a lot of poker players coming to me saying, Lee, I want to continue to be able to play poker, but I want to take the gamble out of me. Right. Um, for me, I don't know if you've ever played poker, but for me, tournaments were never a problem. Cash games were a little bit of a problem, and I would see my little demon come up when I play cash games, for example. Like, I would, there were occasions I would go to the ATM machine, break my own rules, get more money to go back into a cash game, but it never spilled over into I just lost uh, 3,000 playing in a cash game. I'm now going to put 3,000 on red. That this seemed to be a demarcation to me that allowed me to play poker, but not to gamble. 
Okay. Um, what do you think about that? Because I know you went to Gamblers Anonymous and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and is that something you can do? <laughs> because, you know, you talked about the raffle, for example, which ain't poker. Just share your thoughts on it for people listening. Now, I think it's all about suggestions, what people, what I would suggest people would do or not do based upon what's right for me. And I mm. would not play poker. There is absolutely mm. no way because I know that if I did win, it would lead to me putting that money on red, for example. That's what's happened right. in the past. That's my experience. So I would suggest to people, no, don't do it. If you're gonna, mm. if you're gonna stop gambling, don't do that because that's putting you in a risky place. So for me, poker is gambling. You're right in saying it's more of a skillful game though than roulette, which is total chance. So there is that mm. element of skill. And I will talk to people who I know in recovery now. And Ryan, who's on the podcast with me, um, he played a lot of um, poker. He probably won quite a lot of money playing poker. He then lost it all and a lot more because he couldn't stop with the poker. It was all the other stuff. It was the slot machines. It was the roulette. It was the sports betting. Um, So for me personally, it's a no. And that's because I would not just stick to poker. And Mm. poker for me is a form of gambling. But, you know, hey-ho, the world works for everyone, doesn't it? And if somebody can do that, and I certainly would never recommend it, but if it's something that you did and you're comfortable with doing and it works for you, well, then that's your choice. My suggestion personally would be if you don't want to gamble, don't gamble, don't do anything, don't play poker. Like I said, I would say do not do a raffle. So when I'm at work now, somebody's doing a raffle, I'll give them some money and say, don't want the ticket, thanks, because it Mm. could lead me on a slippery slope. So, yeah, Um, so that would be it from my perspective. Yeah, I think I think something to um, touch upon actually is like I haven't played poker now for maybe one two years, um, but it's not a it's got has had nothing to do around gambling. It had more about toxic environments. So as I grew and started to to develop um, as a human being, um, my empathy and my my emotional attunement to toxic environments and toxic people, I started to really feel it. So for example, for seven years straight, I went to the world series of poker for, so I was in the Rio for, for like two to three months every year for seven years straight. And because I worked, I worked at the world series. So I would go out there and I would, I would mix working with playing. And I fucking loved it because anyone like who loves gambling, loves that high, the World Series of Poker, you're in Vegas. I loved it. I never played on the table games or anything, but I just played poker. By the seventh and eighth year, I would go into the Rio during the World Series and it was fucking toxic. I could feel it in the air, the desperation, the um, the unsavory characters that would just fucking rob you in a car park just to have a, a bet. And then I was kind of like, I'm done with this. You know, and the poker industry is a wonderful industry, right? In as much as there are a lot of people in my network who are giving millions and millions of dollars to charity as a result of what they do playing poker. 1,000 Days Sober itself, our investors are all from the poker community, right? So there's a wonderful aspect, and I meet so many people who are – who are really changing people's lives for it. But there is also an unsavory element of it that comes with gambling. Whenever there's money around, there's always like a, a shadow side of it that that is that is present. So, you know, for me, like if I was, if somebody was playing poker and had a gambling problem and they came to me and they wanted to try to sort that out, that is something that we could work on. If somebody was coming to me and they had a gambling problem and they'd never played poker before, and they were saying, can I play poker? I'd be like, no fucking way in a million years. You know, so I think, I actually think that poker actually saved me um, because when I stopped drinking, poker was my thing, and drinking wasn't the thing when we played poker. It was money. It was money and chatter and uh, camaraderie. Like we would travel around the UK playing poker together. Like eight of us would go to Blackpool and we'd all sit around the same table like we would because that was our poker club. And all of a sudden drinking wasn't a part of it. Like even people were drinking, it just wasn't a big deal and I felt safe. Um, So, you know, poker really helped me out. But yeah, I I appreciate that for people got a gambling problem, 
going anywhere near poker is going to be really difficult because you're, you're winning and losing money and you're activating that same dopamine fucking slot machine that's inside each and every one of us, right? Mm, totally, absolutely. Mm. Okay. So just before you go, we touched upon quite a lot of stuff. So if people are listening to this and they've they've got a gambling problem and very often, you know, we can we can stop drinking and then all of a sudden before we know it, we're, we're fucking eating cakes and we're, we're, we're going down the bookies every day. It happens a lot, you know. You touched upon getting a support group and talking to people about it. But what, what else really worked for you in order? Cause think about what you're saying now, you, you were somebody who just was, you know, willing to take a loan out for 25 grand and, 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 uh, and just gamble it. And now you haven't had a bet for three years. So what happened? I like, uh, let's just round off by sharing with people and I'll do the same about what really worked. Yeah, sure. I mean, for me, the first thing was learning to talk. Like I said, learning mm. to talk and learning to listen to people. And you know, listening is a great, great thing as well. So having these two-way conversations. And but the other thing is filling the time, filling the time when I was drinking or filling the time when I was gambling with other activities and mm. things that are more useful for me. Um, so whether that had been, you know, I did quite a lot of reading in that first year. And what I did was I did like one book recovery style book and then one book something else. And it mm. didn't mean to do it that way, but that's kind of how it worked. So I was trying to learn quite a lot of stuff and and just really putting myself out there to talk to people, you know, really kind of, it might sound a bit strange, but making myself putting myself in, an, in, in uncomfortable situations. So I think when a lot of people get in recovery, and I could be wrong in saying this, you know, you're trying to avoid uncomfortable situations because, you know, it's hard enough that anyway, we're just trying to stop drinking or gambling or whatever. But for me, it was like an opportunity to say, if I can actually deal with this situation and get through it without drinking or gambling, then I know I've done it. Then I know I've done it. So it was like about tackling things head on but sensibly you know so talking to people if it was if I found it tough or whatever um, another thing was just to break the day down just to break the mm-hmm. day down and decide I was going to try and have a good day and an example I was, I was talking to a friend at work and he said why are you so happy today you've got a horrendous meeting at three o'clock today I was like I know but it's like mm-hmm. 10 in the morning yeah, so I'll yeah. worry about that three o'clock meeting at quarter to three and I'll mm-hmm. prepare for it for 15 minutes I'll do the meeting and I'll come out and it would have gone good or bad Mm. But even if it's been bad, I'll move on after that. And that was one of the things that really, really helped me. It was just breaking my days into different pieces and not thinking one small thing in a day being bad was going to then mean the whole day was bad. No, it mm. just meant a little bit that day was bad. So what are all the good things? And think about all the good things. And every night thinking about what were the things that were good today? What were the things that weren't so good? Because that gives me an opportunity to work on it next time. So I think it was just trying to be really, really present in the day, not thinking about the future, not thinking about the past, filling my days with useful activities, um, talking to people, facing up to challenges and realising that I could get through those challenges without without drinking or gambling. Mm, thank you for that, Chris. Yeah, just to add to that, my, mine were... Um... First and foremost, like you've got to get over that shame barrier and just offload and talk to someone about what you've done. Because once you do that, then you can get accountability. Um, people can help you. Um, you can sort out financial plans. You're not alone anymore. Like uh, a lot, a lot of it for me was like feeling really alone in my addiction and feeling super shame that I put our house uh, at risk. You know, so that's really important. Finding a support group, talking to people about it. And then um, just just committing to living a conscious life and and learning more about yourself and developing. If you can learn to develop more state of consciousness more and more regularly, you ain't you ain't gonna want to sit by a roulette table fucking twelve hours a day looking at two. It's just that is not how you want to fill your life. So you just don't you just don't get there anymore. Uh, Chris, it's been a really delight. I've really enjoyed it. And um, if anybody wants to learn more about Chris or his work. Um, learn more about his podcast, get involved in his community or reach out to him for some coaching or some help, head over to www.1000daysober.com and the podcast page and you'll find one where Chris will be housed and you'll get all the links to all his wonderful stuff. Chris, thanks a lot for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and I uh, just want to honor you and say thank you for continuing to share your story and uh, doing this beautiful work. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Lee. It's been great, great chatting to you today. If you want to be somebody that doesn't drink alcohol or recover from any other addiction, 
improve your relationship with yourself and those that you love, or just want to learn to live a more conscious life, then here is what we can do to help you at 1000 Days Sober. Number one, we have a Strive subscription service, okay? So you pay a monthly fee, you come and join us, you come into our community, you get access to all our Marco Polo groups, you get access to our Kajabi group, you get access to uh, content that you will not see in the public sphere, mainly by yours truly, but by other people in my network are friends as well. What else do you get? You get access to a weekly coaching call with myself. So you can get coaching, a one-on-one -on -one coaching with me on that weekly coaching call. And you get money off various different workshops and uh, invites to lots of other free stuff. So that's our subscription service. You could do group coaching programs, okay? Right now we have two group coaching programs both called the Strive Method. The first one is addictions, okay? And they last for six months. The relationship course also lasts for six months. We've got Strive Method for addictions, Strive Method for relationships. There are workshops, okay? Or you can work with me personally one-on-one, -on -one, okay? You can work with me personally one-on-one. -on -one. And if you want to get involved in any of that, then just head to www.1000daysober.com and you will find everything that's going on there, okay? We have pages there on the website which will direct you in the right place and how to get older me, including a workshop space there as well. We're always running workshops, so you can sign up for those as well. Last but not least, if you do love this show and it has changed your life and you want to change the lives of somebody else, tell somebody about it and rate and review it in your podcast provider. I would really appreciate that. If you want to just reach out to me, ask me a question, just email me, 1kdaysober.com. Ah, at gmail.com. Much love, everybody. Bye.